Well, skin rashes are a very frequent uh, presentation of this disease, and this first picture here is of a child who has all these red bumps that go way up near his neck. It covers his tummy, his diaper area, it's on his legs and arms. And when you first look at this, it really reminds us of a, a common diaper rash that's really gone crazy. And many children like him present with these bumpy lesions just in their diaper area. They uh, are given uh, creams like Nystatin, which would be used for a, a uh, manilial diaper rash, but it doesn't help. And the rash gets worse and worse, and finally someone biopsies and they find it's LCH. Another way is this really scaly red rash in a, in a newborn who had what they, at first was thought to be very bad eczema, but turned out to be LCH. This child has these yellowish bumps on her face and forehead that look at first glance like an infection, a staph infection, but with a biopsy proved to be the LCH again. Sometimes it looks like a, what we call a contact dermatitis, just redness uh, of the skin, in this case behind the knees and in the fold of the uh, tissue uh, on the thigh. Another way is brown or purplish bumps that can be anywhere on the body, sometimes literally thousands of these. And this type of presentation has sometimes been called a self-healing or hashimoto prisker form of the disease. But we know that children who present with this should be watched very carefully because half of them will have evidence of disease elsewhere. So we don't want to be too uh, cavalier and say just because they have this kind of lesion, it's going to be a very simple uh, problem. LCH can occur in the mouth too. It can affect the gums, such as, as this child right here next to the teeth and the gingiva has this ulcer. Ulcers might be in the cheek or back by the tonsils. Sometimes teeth can be involved too. And this child has very, very uh, enlarged uh, gums and the teeth have been pushed out, not only by the uh, gums being large, but also because the disease is in the bones and some children present, uh, young children, have teeth coming in at a very abnormal age, like a one month old will already have molars because the disease is pushing the teeth out. So anytime a child has an unusual eruption of their teeth, we have to be thinking about longer Hans cell histocytosis. It can invade the gut, it can get into the intestines, and this is a picture of a biopsy specimen and the reddish brown stain here shows the CD1A cells that are not supposed to be in the, in the intestine accumulating in several places in these uh, parts of the intestine we call villi. And when they get there, the villi don't absorb food and water as they're supposed to, and the child will have very dramatic diarrhea and very low protein. And with low protein, they might have a lot of uh, edema or swelling of their body. So how do we treat this disease? Well, the best way to treat is for your child or for you, an adult patient, to be put on a histocyte society trial or a protocol. And these studies have been designed by a variety of experts from around the world with the thoughts first of safety and second of efficacy, which means that we want to treat patients without causing problems with side effects from the drugs, and we want to find medicines that make the disease better. And fortunately, over the course of the past 20 years, the Histocyte Society has had uh, three very successful trials to advance our knowledge in the treatment of longer Hans cell histocytosis. And these can only happen when patients are put onto a study, because if a doctor in city A decides he's going to treat a patient one way and someone in city B decides they're going to treat the patient another way, you don't learn anything because the patients have such different uh, kinds of uh, therapies put towards them. And typically, we don't take very note, careful notes of how the response to therapy if we're not putting patients on a clinical trial. Because a, a clinical trial means that there's a very ordered set of studies that have to be done to diagnose the disease and then follow the patient to see how the patient responds at certain times and have a very rigid uh, follow-up protocol as well as a very exact treatment plan so that everybody's treated the same way and perhaps they are randomized that would be by a computer program that would just say Johnny goes to treatment A and Susie goes to treatment B so that takes the, the prejudice of the doctor and the family out of the, the process and by accumulating hundreds of patients 
th this way, we can come to scientifically valid conclusions. And without that, we don't advance our knowledge. So what is a protocol or a study? Well, it's something that has to be approved in each hospital. And so every university hospital or every hospital that would treat patients with LCH has a committee which looks over the treatment studies and looks at them very carefully to make sure that they're safe and that all the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, organization is behind the, the treatment that will make sure that the, it's watched over and that safety is considered first and we also get the right data. And so that committee is called an IRB, or Institutional Review Board. Once that board has decided the study is safe, then it's approved for use in your hospital, and your doctor can put your, your child or you as an adult patient on the Histocyte Society study. And then data from you or your, your patient is uh, <clears throat> then transferred to the Histocyte uh, Center, where all the patient's data is accumulated, and then a scientifically sound uh, conclusion is reached about what we have learn from the results of this study. So how do we treat patients now? Well, the current Histocyte Society protocol for LCH in children has three parts. The first part is for children who have the very high-risk disease, meaning presence of LCH in the liver, lungs, spleen, or bone marrow. And in this case, we are trying to add an, a new drug, methotrexate, to what we would call the standard treatment, vinblastin, prednisone, and mercaptopurine. And we're trying to see if adding this new drug first by intravenous application or by oral application it, it allows us to cure more patients and also importantly we want to make sure it's not causing problems. The results of this study aren't in yet so I can't give any preliminary conclusions but it is uh, the way the study is done that we randomize the, the patients between these two arms. The second group of patients we call the low risk, and those are children or who have the disease in their uh, bones, skin, and lymph nodes. And these children are randomized between either six or 12 months of therapy, because we're really not quite sure if the longer therapy is better or not. I'm gonna show you some data in a little bit that suggests maybe 12 months is better, but that study didn't have enough patients to be really scientifically uh, sound, so we're trying to get a larger study done so that we can really prove once and for all if a longer therapy is good. And finally, there's a third group of patients who have the disease just in their bones in several places or who have disease in uh, very certain bones we call CNS risk, which means central nervous system risk. And those bones are around the eye and around the ear. We know that Children who have disease there have a higher chance of this pituitary problem called diabetes insipidus. And if we have uh, treated them with uh, just surgery or just prednisone or just radiation, that chance of diabetes insipidus is much higher than if they get Velban and prednisone. So we want to treat all of the patients in those categories with Velban and prednisone for six months and follow them and see how they do over the course of time.